Hi, my name is Janelle Riley. I'm an editor at Variety and welcome to this Q&A with Loki. At this time, please join me in welcoming today's guests who built this funny, tragic, epic yet intimate world. We have actor and executive producer, Tom Hiddleston, executive producer and director of all six episodes, Kate Heron, creator, writer, executive producer, Michael Waldron, composer, Natalie Holt, production designer, Kazra Farahani, Cinematographer, Autumn Dural. Thank you all so much for being here. <laughs> Whenever I have people as accomplished as you, I actually love to go back and start at the beginning and ask, what was your first job in this business? The first time you felt you could call yourself a director or call yourself a writer. And, you know, it can be what you consider to be your first job or it can be the first time you got paid, anything like that. Um, and let's start with Autumn. Um, I think I, I shot an interview with Landon Donovan He's a soccer player on a beach with like a point and shoot camera. And I, I got like 200 bucks for it. Your first job was paying. That's pretty good. Like first job shooting something minus school. Cause I went to AFI for shooting and oh. that was, I paid for that to shoot myself. <laughs> <laughs> Kazra, what about you? Um, what my first job as a designer, do you mean? Um, that I would think was a, a web series for uh this the video game halo they did a web series some years ago and it was a big break for me to actually be uh being able to design it other, other than just art directing somebody else's designs so that was that was very exciting so 10 minute episodes but for me it was a big deal that's huge out of the gate i mean halo's huge it was great it was a it was a lucky break for sure and like i said there was only 10 minute episodes but it, it definitely felt to me huge. Yeah. Natalie, what about for you? Um, yeah, so I, I went to film school, the National Film Television School. So I got to pretend to be a film composer there. But I think my first job after I left was scoring a pilot for Tiger Aspect for a director friend from film school, but the pilot didn't get picked up. <laughs> Still, <laughs> <Which was sad. laughs> Kate, what about for you? Um, so my first paid job, I was actually isn't directing. I was paid to write jokes for a football prank show that never aired. Uh, and I know nothing about football, which might have played a hand in why <laughs> that happened. But I don't know. They, I, money is money, guys. <laughs> and like, uh, yeah, I was like, yeah, I love football. I'd love to write some jokes for you guys. So uh, that's my first paid job. But probably the first time I felt like a director, I think like everyone said, honestly, it was probably just making films with my friends, like where I was trying it out. I mean, I wasn't getting paid to do it, but you know, I was getting to work out how I like to work with a team and yeah, and just work out how the hell directing kind of works really. Because I think that's the thing as a director, you can't really practice it unless you're on set. So, so often more of the time you're just doing it on like low budget stuff with your friends, you know? Do you remember any of those wacky football jokes you had to write? Oh, they were just stupid. I had to just come up with scenarios to like trick football players or football fans. I mean, they were, they were, they were super weird. I, I was amazed they hired me, but uh yeah, I mean, but thank you for the money. <laughs> was one of them Landon Donovan on a beach? Was that I wish. <laughs> but yeah, no, it was just like, it was just, yeah, it was just stupid. It was like a weird mascot and stuff like that. I mean, like I said, I couldn't believe that they hired me, but here we go. <laughs> and Tom, for you? My first job was playing Lord Number Two. Um, so important that I didn't have a name. <laughs> um, uh, Lord number two, number 57 on the call sheet <clears throat> of um, the life and adventures of Nicholas Nickleby for ITV uh, in the year at 2000. Yeah, unforgettable. Wait, who was your Nicholas Nickleby? James Darcy. Okay, so I've seen this. I didn't know you were in that. I mean, Blink in your mouth. It's like a, it's a, it's a blink. It really is a very short, <laughs> short appearance. Um, no, it's, it, James was terrific. And uh, Charles Dance plays uh, Uncle Ralph and uh, Sophia Miles is Kate. Um, and um, I was a kind of uh, foppish, um, a kind of drunken lord at a party that Kate goes to. And she's surrounded by these boorish young men um and 
my job, I think, on camera was to eat and drink as much as I could, which I did. But I learned a lot. So I, I, in the master, I, I ate my entire plate of food. And then somebody came over to me and said, OK, now you have to eat that every take. And I went, ah. Oh. Right. <laughs> it, was a, it, was a, it was a big day of eating. I learned a lesson that day. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's what they say. They say not to actually eat because yeah. you'll have to do it every single time. Although they did use it, they used it. The director was so impressed. He was like, no one else was eating, but Tom, you were going for it. And they ended up in the final cut. So there you go. Lord number two was really committed. I love that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I would love to start at the beginning with Loki. And I, I guess that would be with Tom, because I imagine there's literally no series without your participation. Who was it who first floated the idea of the series and specifically this idea involving, you know, the TVA and various variants? And what was sort of your initial reaction? Because it's so cool when you see it, but I feel like if it was described to me, I would just sort of shake my head. Well, to go back to the beginning, I remember I got a call from uh, Kevin Feige and Luis de Esposito at Marvel Studios. Uh, and if I'm correct in thinking, uh, this might have been the like early spring of 2018, uh, I think. Um, and they told me about Disney Plus and and the idea of the studio they were going to launch this streaming platform, and that um, Marvel, particularly alongside the various other studios within the umbrella of Disney, were, were going to create new stories and Kevin and Lou had said the first thing we thought of was we've got to make a show about Loki which I was really flattered by and I thought well what I had just finished uh an Avengers Infinity War was about to be released uh, and I think that Loki's demise felt very conclusive and so my first question was well how do we what do we do how do we undo that um do we undo that what happens now and um and then the following July, July 2018, I sat down in London with Kevin Feige and Stephen Broussard, terrific uh, producer at Marvel. And um, we talked a bit about some of the things that we wanted to explore, maybe things to things we felt had been themes and stories and relationships we felt had been completed in in the movies. And by the end of that August, uh, Kevin Wright um, and Stephen had put together a kind of 25 page document of ideas that they come up with, one of which was the TVA. And it was extremely exciting um, because I had already shot the piece in Avengers Endgame. And so their brilliant idea was that, you know, in the time heist of Avengers Endgame, Loki picks up the Tesseract and disappears. And so there was some untold story about where he goes and that he would be apprehended and arrested by the TVA, an organization that claims to govern the order of time and the structure of reality, that Loki was somehow now a time criminal. Um, and you had this huge bureaucratic institution that represented order and Loki is this anarchic embodiment of chaos and I thought well there there's an idea but now we have a, a, a story we have a jumping off point uh, that felt fresh original new and really exciting um and then I uh did some reading about the TVA but probably not as reading much reading as as Michael and Kate um uh but that's yeah that was the beginning of it that's that's the beginning of the story I was going to say, I did a little bit of research yesterday uh, about the TVA and the comics. And there's like, you probably know this, but there's a unicorn Loki. There are all kinds of Lokis. <laughs> That's all I know. <laughs> did you have any like personal, uh, did, were you like, let's not do the unicorn? Or did you just sort of trust completely? In, no, or, or, I, I'm okay. always open, always open to any, any suggestions. Yeah. Um, we didn't get to do the unicorn this time, but... I've learned to, uh, you never say never in the Marvel universe. <laughs> so Michael, I feel like there's there's so many different ways this series could have gone. And I so admire that you didn't play it safe. You really trusted the audience and, and your great team here. How did you sort of hit upon the story you wanted to tell and hit upon that tone? Well, 
as I've said before, you got to test the fences at Marvel. Uh, so we, we, we just said, let's, let's take the biggest swings we possibly can. Uh, in, in my very first meeting with, with those producers that Tom mentioned, I, I said to them, I said, what if, what if the Loki show was the best show anybody's ever seen? Uh, and, and I, and I meant that because, because it, you know, look, a Loki TV show with Tom, there, there's a way that certainly you could come in and, and mail that in and just do some hacky sketch comedy time travel and, you know, and it'd be a layup. People are going to watch it no matter what. Um, I was excited to, to try and, and really just make something super ambitious. Um, and fortunately, you know, the, the team around us, you know, elevated it even beyond what I dreamt it could be, you know, everybody on this project, I feel like, uh, had that approach of, you know, what if this is the best show anybody's ever seen? Um, and, and it is, it's the best show anybody's ever seen. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't worry you were putting too much pressure on yourself by setting that goal? <laughs> I mean, in hindsight, that seems like an insane thing to say in your first meeting at Marvel, but I, I don't, I don't know. I, it was late in the day. I, I, yeah, I don't know. Shot my shot. <laughs> I feel like it, when you're working in this universe, you have to be able to throw out any ideas and try anything or at least discuss it. Has there ever been a point where somebody was like, no, that's too far? Or is everything open for discussion? Everything's open for discussion. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, no, I mean, I, I, I think that if you can justify, I mean, Alligator Loki is a great example of that, why? Why is there an alligator Loki? Well, because he's green. Uh, you know, th that's, that's good enough. Um, you know, I, I, I think that if there's a reason for something to be there, if you can play it straight within the truth of the story you're telling and it's additive, then, then yeah, it doesn't matter how crazy it is. Sometimes if you have a crazy idea, it's nice to, to bury that pitch uh, within an even crazier pitch to kind of distract them with the really ridiculous ideas. They say, no, 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 we can't do that. And then they let you do the slightly less crazy thing that you actually wanted to do. I love that. I've heard that's what sketch comedy writers do. They always <laughs> write, they write one with it that they, that they know people will say, you cannot do that. But then we'll take the slightly less weird one. Yeah, the stocking horse. Yeah. <laughs> Janelle, you know, My Michael's right. You, you, ha we ha you have to go for it. We used to say on set, it's only forever. You know, it's, it's a, <laughs> and it's a, it's a kind of, it's a light that, 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 that guides you to commitment and just throwing your whole soul at something. And I knew this felt, it genuinely felt, of course, it's a character that people know from before, but this story in this show felt completely new new relationships, new dynamics, new environment, new context, new theme. Um, and you never know, none of us ever know how many chances you're going to get. And so we just thought, let's go for it. Let's be as brave and as creative and as committed as we can. Um, there's no guarantees ever. And I felt that certainly, you know, Loki's a fish out of water this time, stripped of everything that's familiar, stripped of Asgard, Thor, Odin, all the things that, that you're used to seeing Loki in the context of. He's in this new place, has no answers, has no information. And in a similar way, I, I felt this was a new thing, new place, new information, new dynamics. It's only forever. You've got to go for it. <laughs> And Kate, oh, the bloom. Yep, yep. Sorry. Speaking of going for it, I, that's what I feel like your all your previous work has done, and this seems like a perfect fit for your sensibilities. I'm curious how you went about landing the job, and and what did you think you could bring with your very specific voice to it? Yeah. So uh, with landing the job, I knew they were making a show about Loki. Um, so I just basically asked my agent to call Marvel until they would meet me. <laughs> basically um but yeah I think for me going in like you know 
I, I love the character of Loki. I really wanted to work with Marvel. Um, like many audience members, I was like, where did he go? I thought at the very least, if I didn't get the job, I'd at least find out before everyone where Loki went. That, uh, that was sort of the uh, the end goal. And then it's so, so such a bigger reward. But uh, no, I, I think for me, honestly, it was just, I always wanted to direct on this level. And I'm sure like the rest of the team, you know, like would say this, like, you know, I just knew it was my chance to show I could do that. And I kind of like with the effects, for example, you know, like my backgrounds in comedy and drama, the most effects I've done is like painting out a sound man or a track, you know, that it might be in shot. I've never done stuff on the level we did here, but I just went into the pitch with loads of references and was like, I don't necessarily know like the steps to get to this, but this is emotionally why I think this would look cool. And this is what I think the end result should look like. So for example, like the time theater, I thought it'd be cool if like, you know, it looked like a play of Loki's life on a stage. And I had like Minority Report as a reference for that where Tom Cruise sees, you know, his wife in that film and she's like a 3D like life-size projection because it's really painful. It feels like he could reach out and touch her, but she's not there. And that taking that idea to what we do in the time theater felt really appropriate for what we had in the script. So. Yeah, so I think that was like a big thing really. And yeah, I'm just going for it in the pitch. I mean, I just really went for it, so. Now you say you haven't worked obviously on anything in this scale, but you you have worked with tentacles before. True, I mean, yes. <laughs> I have worked with puppets and lots of actors, but I, I think honestly for me, like something I learned on Sex Ed, for example, is me and Laurie would always talk about wearing your heart on your sleeve. And I think for me, like good genre, if you take away like the world that it's set in and all the bells and whistles, like what's the story really about? And I think something that was really clear on the page when I got the scripts was, this is a story about Loki and their identity and what it means, like what makes us us. And that to me as a question is so rich as a filmmaker and so exciting to explore that. And I think it was honestly for me always about like for the whole team, like how do we make sure the emotion is grounded and real and that's what's guiding us through. And then all the rest of the spectacular sci-fi world is a bonus, really, on top of that. And something that's got a lot of attention, rightfully, is the look of this series, because uh, you take us through so many weird, so many worlds, and yet they all do feel a part of the same cohesive universe. Um, Autumn, I'm curious, when you came on board, what were the discussions that you had with Michael and Kate about the look of this? And was there anything that sort of inspired it or that you wanted to pay homage to? Yeah, I mean, we had such a great meeting. Um... I met Kate and uh, Kevin Wright, and then line producer, um, another Marvel executive. And it, I hadn't met Kate before, um, and you know we had we didn't have like mutual friends or anything. But um, she just really impressed me in the meeting with her references. They were all kind of in line with after I read some of the drafts, um, and was intrigued. And I mean, originally intrigued because Tom is so charming. So if like Tom's in the show. And then you walk in and she's got Zodiac references and Blade Runner references. Um, and, you know, the writing that I read, I, I think they might have given me one episode before my meeting um, was so great. And we kind of just hit it off. I mean, she had shown me a lot of stuff that I was already thinking after I read it. Um, you know, uh, just noir references going a bit darker, moody, some more stylish characters moving in and out of light. And, um, you know, a lot of the sets in the references she showed were architectural and yeah, it kind of just hit and ticked all of the boxes of how I like to shoot. So um, we were already on the same page from the beginning. I think most of the team were that she chose and everyone chose um, and we just kind of clicked. So it was very easy to kind of do your best work in that environment. Now I totally get Blade Runner, but forgive me because I, I did fail out of film school. Uh, Zodiac is a fascinating reference. Is, is, there, is there something you can point to specifically where we might see where, you know, where that came into play? Yeah, I mean, Kate and I love that movie. Um, there's so much tension between story and character um, and you're taken kind of on a journey with him to find out the result of all of, you know, kind of what they're looking for, you know, it's like, and you have this kind of buddy system that these two characters have. So, I mean, I kind of just drew from that as far as like the mood and the tone of it. Um, and also the way that there are shots in that film that I think Kate likes to, you know, kind of do these like details that give you kind of tidbits of how to figure certain things out, little Easter eggs. And that was something that was important to her. So um, stylistically it was great, but also just very character driven film with very strong performances. 
And Kazra, uh, speaking of detail, the design of these worlds are so specific. And on one hand, it, it feels like an homage to times past and yet completely original at the same time. What were sort of the conversations about making this world, you know, realistic yet fantastical? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think from the first document I read was something uh, Michael had written that I think he mentioned Blade Runner meets uh, Mad Men, which is very, very evocative straight away. You get a you get a clear picture of the kind of atmosphere uh, of the world. And then that was sort of a starting point. And then in, in chatting with Kate, uh not unlike autumn's experiences with kate like we just i came into my pitch and it turned out that many of the images in my deck were images that were also in kate's deck um we were just sort of in sync that way and i mean i guess if i had to boil it down i'd say the look of at least the tva sets very much is like the marriage of the kind of authoritarian version of mid-century modernism that you that I mean, it's not authoritarian in its design brutalism or in its intent. It's meant to be very utilitarian, but it ends up having this kind of monolithic imposing. Uh, and at times it is quite authoritarian in some of the Eastern European uh, cities where it was implemented. So it's like a marriage of that brutalist look that I think Kate maybe grew up not far from in places in London. Uh, and then the whimsical version of mid-century modernism that I grew up with in on the west coast of the United States, um, where everything was built sort of at the, in the post-war era for, for a booming population. Um, and so I think the kind of weird, uncanny quality of the TVA that I think is, is born from the writing, uh, but echoed through the architecture is, is because of like, the marriage of that monolithic, heavy, imposing architecture with very almost happy, bright colors and warm wood uh, veneer that you would have from West Coast uh, mid-century modernism. I think it's that kind of cocktail that defines that TVA feel. Tom, I'm curious as an actor, you can do all this research, you can play a character for years, what is it like to actually step on those incredible sets? And how much does that help you like really find the character in the scene? So helpful. I mean, obviously have done lots of green and blue screen in my life, <laughs> um, but to walk onto these sets was truly to be immersed in the world of the TV gate. It's so evocative. It's so immediately inspiring and you know, if 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 an actor's job is to is to make the leap of imagination, to to commit first, to believe that these four walls are in the bowels of a um, enormous institution, uh, and that it feels oppressive and constrictive and confusing, these sets would you, you just? It's so easy to make that commitment. It's so easy to do the imagining, to do the work of imagining. And immediately it feels very uh, inventive. You feel very inventive in the space. Um, Kate and Autumn and Owen and Wumi Masaku and Gugu and Bataro and Sophia De Martino, we're immediately choreographing scenes because the, the spaces are so thrilling and so imaginative. Um, it's so easy to move around and it feels so tangible, so real. One of my favorite things, I've talked to this before, that Kasra did was he gave us ceilings. Um, and they were, they were, they were, it's very, you know, it's, it's, it's a strange thing because the audience often supplies the idea that every room must have a ceiling, but often, on, as you know, on any set they don't. Above the top of the frame is where the lights are. But there was, there was such fantastic ceilings, which always felt, they were either cavernous um, atri atria, where, which you feel would kind of echo and reverberate, or they were very low, um, constrictive, um, inducing a feeling of paranoia and um, imprisonment. And they were just very thrilling spaces to occupy. I think that was really key, like with our whole team being united, because, you know, Autumn and me were talking about like Zodiac, for example, and like, you know, we had seven as a reference as well, but like, 
in those movies, the camera, especially seven, like the camera is low and you want to look up. And I think, you know, having those ceilings allowed us to do that. But the other thing that we were all united on with having practical sets was, you know, like we had references like Scott Pilgrim or Eternal Sunshine. But I think those films are amazing because, you know, you can have actors walk from one set to another and it's seamless, you know, you can do that in a one -er. And that was really important for us in this was, you know, we're building this whole new corner of the TVA and we want to make it feel real and lived in. So having these amazing sets from Kazra, you know, for example, with Tom and Owen, I could have them leave like the elevator and walk down the corridor and go right into the time theater, which you can't do obviously if it's not all joined together. But I think that was definitely something as a team we were all very united on was just, yeah, trying to make it feel as, well, I guess grounded as possible considering the extraordinary circumstances. <laughs> Um, Natalie, I want to thank you, but I also sort of want to curse you because your theme is everywhere um, or your music is everywhere, specifically the, the green theme. Um, I don't know if you spend any time on TikTok, but I feel like every other okay. video. <laughs> wise, that is wise. <laughs> and I, I, I'm so fascinated by composing because from what I understand, you're creating themes for this world, but you start with just scripts to go off of. I'm curious where you even begin and if that changes much when you actually see an almost finished product, if, if actors being cast changes the way that you approach it. You know, I just feel like there's so much room for change. It, well, I suppose usually on a project, you'll get a script and you have to fill in all the blanks, including who the actors are and everything. And so you kind of had a head start with this because there's such a, you know, you know that how Tom's going to play it and you've got all these movies that you can watch and see and kind of get inside the character before you you kind of get started on the theme so I, I felt like I kind of had a head start and actually because I had to pitch for the job after I met Kate I kind of wrote um I scored the, the time um theater sequence in episode one and I came up with a Loki theme in that pitch which actually stuck and stayed um so yeah, I, I don't know, it, it was kind of just a, a gift to get to, to, to have this space, like we were talking about as well, to kind of be creative, like often on a project, you, you feel like you're kind of written in, you're boxed in a corner and you have to follow these things. And, and there was this real sense of freedom with, with um, Kate particularly just had all these cool references, but she wasn't prescriptive about them. And, and I just felt like we were all given such freedom to sort of do our own thing on this and 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 everyone just pulled their best work out of the bag I think <laughs> in all departments. I actually understand you and Kate and I have something in common which is that we love the theremin. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Was that something you knew you wanted to do from the start? I think Natalie we both we never also we never spoke about it right but I remember because in my pitch I had uh, the swan on theremin but when you pitched to us and you know showed us what you'd done to the scene you had theremin in there so I remember being like oh my god she's used theremin <laughs> and I was like it's meant to be but I don't know I think for me I guess because it's such a a strange instrument but it's also you know it's like we wanted the show to feel like a love letter to sci-fi and for me it's an immediate sci-fi sound but yeah I don't know if that was the same thing with you Natalie but well, I, I remember like um, reading the script and like I hadn't seen any of it and I hadn't even had a meeting with you at that point and for some reason like I had this clockwork orange like kind of thought of, of how the TVA would look and I was I, I love Wendy Carlos and I kind of loved that um, the soundtrack for clockwork orange and I kind of brought that up in the meeting and you were like oh that's been one of our visual references which was kind of cool so it, it was good to kind of join the dots on that and then I kind of loved the way in Clockwork Orange they used that um classical that that kind of feeling that you get from when, when you hear a piece of Beethoven but it's been reimagined on a synthesizer um and so, and and it brings this kind of classic quality like this sort of Shakespearean grandness but it's on an unusual instrument so we kind of talked about that as well which was kind of an inspiration for the score. Because you're combining all these genres and the show is funny, but dramatic and heartfelt, but also joyous. I'm really curious about balancing all these tones. Michael, does that begin with you, you know, with the writing? Um, I imagine it goes all the way through through the editing. Sometimes maybe you, you really find it in post. Yeah, I mean, I guess it, I mean, you know, it, it 
it's a show about Loki who, who kind of encapsulates the full range mm-hmm. of, of human emotion. I, you know, as, as Owen and Tom talked about when they were kind of, it's like Loki can play the heavy keys and he can play the, uh, the, the light keys. And, and so uh, it felt like the show itself had to be willing to, you know, really take advantage of Tom's um, amazing talents. Yes, it, 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 it's Loki's funny. And so we, we wanted to have moments of levity and all of that. Uh, but I think that really where the show sings is when we went to the more dramatic places, uh, you know, when, when he's sitting opposite Mobius, um, being almost analyzed and being forced to self-reflect and, and being forced to be vulnerable in a way that frankly, supervillains typically can't in a two hour blockbuster movie, but maybe they can in a six hour television series. That, that felt like the great opportunity uh, with this series was to do something totally new, tonally. I mean, Kate, on set, do you do you do takes in radically different ways? Do you do like, let's do a funny version, let's do a dramatic version? Um, or again, is it something that, that you just instinctively know on the day of the shooting? Yeah, I would say it's funny. I'm sure, Tom, you could speak <laughs> more just because I try to think like, what on earth do I do? Um, but I think it's, we always got like a lot of options, right? Like you get what's on the page and you kind of get it at different levels. You might push the emotion in a take and be like, okay, let's have one that's, you know, a bit more like, let's play a bit more subtle on the next one. I think with comedy anyway, it's like the emotion or the, it's the stakes that make it funny, right? Like the emotion's got to be real or you kind of lose the comedy in the moment. Um, But honestly, I think usually it's, I, I, I like to do like a bit of rehearsal before so we can all talk about character, get everyone's ideas in there. But on the day, really, I think it's also just being ready to throw that away if you find something amazing and making sure there's space to play as well would be my thought because sometimes you just find stuff on the day there might be a prop or you know just one of the actors you know I'm sure Tom I'm, I'm sure many a morning came in and were like oh I've had an idea actually for this line or this week so yeah I think we definitely like we were always I guess it's the Marvel way right you're always I think they call it plussing you're always trying to plus the idea so I think that for me is like just getting as many options as we can and making sure the emotion is always grounded and true is sort of my trajectory for it. I mean, Kate, I think what Kate was so generous and so free um, in, you were so free in your direction. I think there were times when you had a very specific idea of what you needed and you were absolutely correct. Um, and, but like anything or any human being, um, sometimes emotional truth expresses itself in very visible and legible ways. And sometimes it expresses itself in very quiet um, ways. And there are many different shades of the same truth. And so Kate would encourage me to try, as long as it was truthful and honest, it didn't really matter what the size of it was, and so we would talk about, is this, you know, are we building up to this? Is this the right um, tone? Is this the right expression of this truth in this moment? Can the story, can the scene take this much emotional expression or does it need to be more sublimated, more internal? Um, and it's such an enjoyable process when you have the time and you have a fluency in your communication as, as I think you and I did, Kate. Um, but some things just feel, sometimes we would just feel right. We feel we've got it immediately. Um, It's an interesting experience when Loki's watching uh, the events of his life Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of episode one. Um, And it's events that the audience, if they've seen all the MCU movies um, will be familiar with, but this Loki is not familiar with. So in, in a sense, He's watching a future he hasn't lived out, but it has a the echo, almost like a memory, an echo of familiarity. Sees the death of his mother, sees the death of his father, and sees his own death. And there was some extremely emotional takes of that. And we just played around with how much we wanted to see. Um, I think there was some quite uh, 
intense. I had a sort of quite intense breakdowns a couple of times, um, but we we in in the we sort of graded it. It was modulated in the right way, and then Kate modulated it carefully in the edit. Um, uh, and I think what ended up in the in Kate's cut in the final cut was exactly the right way. Um, and actually, I believe Loki looking at his own death, at the death at the hand of Thanos. Because uh, in reality, I was just looking at a at a grey wall. There was no footage. There was nothing. There was nothing there. Um, and so it was just Kate and I trying to calibrate what these emotional responses would be. And however I seem to appear, or however Loki seems to respond to his death, I think that came out of a take where his grief at the death of his parents and his sense of loss and missing his family and missing his brother. There was such an expression of grief in that particular take that then when it got to sort of watching the death, the kind of blankness, there was a, um, almost like a layer of skin peeled away because I'd already been through so much mm. um, emotionally. So it was really exciting. But then I remember when Mobius is pruned and, and the uh, audience believes that he's gone, Loki's arrested and and um, and led through a corridor. And I remember, Kate, you were so specific about the depth of grief that you wanted from me in that moment, or from Loki. And um, we did it a couple of times because it just needed the we needed the grief, that hollowness of that helplessness and hollowness of grief to be so raw. And um, sometimes you have to do it a couple of times to get to that depth. One thing as well I would say that was definitely unique about this was obviously, um, like so many productions, obviously we were shut down six weeks into filming. But what we did do within that was, you know, like I started editing, we'd filmed a lot of episode one. And so I just started to cutting together the time theater scenes. And, you know, I shared them with Michael and the writers. And I think something that obviously for morale, we were like, oh, it's good, great. And, but also beyond that, I'm, I'm sure Michael, like you and Eric and the rest of the team must have seen, but I remember there were little details that, you know what I mean? Like there's always details, right? That when you see actors like starting to pull a character together and put a performance, that you're like, oh, that's something funny that Owen does as Mobius. Let's bring more of that out. And I, I think definitely in the scripts, it tonally, we were like, kind of what you were saying, Michael, like, it was very clear to us like you know we did have these beautiful very funny moments but the heart and i'd say like leaning into the heart and the warmth i think that was very clearly like coming out in those early episodes and so i think we were like it, it gives you a confidence right to be like oh well we can see keep going towards that or like bring it out more owen has a great owen wilson has a wonderful turn of phrase about it which is um to not to keep that scenes and characters and and their communications have to have teeth um and that the more teeth the more the more teeth in something the more the more something can can contain opportunities for very very serious deep drama and also very very funny comedy um and um i remember that was a real that was a really helpful term he kept saying let's keep the teeth keep the teeth in it um, we're almost out of time, but I want to ask everyone before we go, because taking the COVID pandemic even out of this, this is a big ensemble, a big world, so many challenges. I'm curious for each of you, what was the scene or the moment that, um, you know, maybe you found the most challenging, you spent the most time with? Uh, Kazra, I, I understand your paint supervisor actually wanted to kill you. So <laughs> I know <laughs> that, that, that that had to be uh, uh, very difficult. You know what? Um... It was difficult. It was really uh, demanding for our crafts department because basically, I, I, as far as I'm concerned, Loki was basically making six Marvel movies uh, mm -hmm. because the appetite and the ambition of the world building, both from, from the writing stage through the design and photography uh, to the acting and the post and, and music, it was all at that blockbuster level, I feel. And so that our, our construction team and all the brilliant crafts people were really put through their paces on this one, I think. In some ways, maybe more so than a feature, Marvel feature, because of the sheer amount of variety that they had to, to do in, in this amount of time. 
Um, and they were all graceful and gracious and super collaborative and brought their A game. And, um, and we tried not to change paint colors too many times. There was a few times that happened. Uh, but I think it was pretty reasonable. I think nobody would disagree with that. Do you have a favorite set or a, a set that was the most challenging? Um, you know what? They were they were all challenging and they were all incredibly rewarding. And it sounds like a kind of a, a non-answer, but it's the honest truth. I think that I, a favorite set changes every time I'm asked this question. I think the one that I go to the most as as just really being really fun and in some ways capturing the spirit of the of the show i hope is the what we call the loki palace which was that strange um bowling alley disused bowling alley thing in in episode five where all the different types of loki's uh have their moment together yeah. <laughs> natalie what about for you uh, um i guess i felt i found it just you know, always with a project, you're finding your voice and, and the themes and how they work. And, and it, it feels like a challenge. And episode one always feels like, um, you know, you're, you're kind of finding your feet. But like having that big gap of, of COVID, um, I felt like we kind of had a, an extra luxury of more time and space to kind of do that. But um, I, I'm flipping this answer on its head because I just loved writing for the last episode because I just felt and it, it just came so quickly as well and I, I kind of felt like I knew what to do and it was just you know you're in the flow with something and I was like I just want to keep writing more episodes I don't want to stop. <laughs> Autumn for you? Yeah I, I want to echo what Kasra said because it we had so many craftspeople working at their like the the highest level and kind of also what Tom said it's like you know, everyone's just like, bring your best work. Everyone's doing that every day on set. Um, we're not working in fear, which is such a lovely environment to work in where you can be very creative and people are, you're bouncing ideas off people and they're allowing you to kind of explore your, you know, most creative vision and, you know, um, no one's saying no and they're supporting you. So it was a really supportive environment. Um, and that's what you see on screen. Uh, but my favorite set, I was speaking to Casper about this, is, is definitely the time theater. I just, ever since I saw the first drawings of that set and then we walked on it and, you know, giving the actors a space that's lit and, you know, they can look anywhere and it feels real. And it's it was so like grand and imposing. And, you know, Kate and I like those scenes where people are talking. Like we like to kind of be subtle with our camera movement and, kind of be dramatic and then Tom's like using the light moving in and out of it it was really brilliant to see that so that's always I think even though there's so many beautiful sets that was my favorite um, kind of environment to work in. Michael for you? Um, well aside from all the time travel stuff which was which, which was which was hard to figure out I mean I it was all challenging and rewarding all at once is every is everybody saying i i guess i i do go back to episode one loki and mobius in the time theater in terms of what felt like maybe the highest degree of difficulty um but also that just that i'm most proud of because to you know that scene's doing so much. It's introducing Mobius, who's a character who has no real background or character in the comics, you know, and you're, you're kind of asking the audience to fall in love with him. It's actually psychoanalyzing Loki, a very complex character who's really resisted being broken down or forced into self-reflection over several movies to this point. And then beyond that, it, it it's kind of, it was daring Marvel to let us make a show that could have 12 page scenes of dialogue. And when the response to that script came back, can, we, can it be longer? Can we have more of this? That was so thrilling and, and felt like such a victory. And, and the only way that works is everybody around me uh, just absolutely working at the top of their game and beyond 
and bringing that to life in such an amazing cinematic way. Um, but yeah, I guess, I guess that sequence I'll always just be so, so proud of. Kate, for you? Oh, I, I think all of it was like, because what everyone said, right, though, it, it was what made the, it so exciting because there was so much variety, you know, everything from like Rock's Cart to The Void and like they all presented their own challenges. I think honestly, this <laughs> sounds so silly, but just pull, that we pulled it off because like I said, like even just like the run through Lamentus, like, you know, we had to put that right at the end of schedule because it was very ambitious, but it was also, you know, safety wise, we had to make sure, can we execute this in a way that we can do in a safe way for everyone? Because obviously it, that was during the pandemic. And I think I'm just forever grateful to be honest to all our team, because I think the reason we could carry off everything we did in this show is because it wasn't even just like, you know, us as like heads of department, it was like everyone within our departments working really hard. And yeah, I think for me, like, that was the challenge, just getting it done, like landing the plane, basically, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and finally, Tom? I, have to, I agree with, with everything that, that everyone has said, and, and um, particularly Kate, just it, it, the whole thing felt so... Uh, I personally ha had a little... Um, I wanted this to be the best, my most um, deeply investigated, most committed performance of Loki that I'd ever given. And um, it was, I didn't want to, I felt so, um, I didn't want to break him. I didn't want to break the character. I wanted this to be just as good, if not better than any iteration. And I knew it was all new and, um, the whole crew was, the be I mean, they the best crew of all time. People were working outside of themselves um, because they believed in it so much. And uh, especially through the pandemic, which had all kinds of challenges, as we know. Um, I think if, if I think in terms of probably every time you go to work, every project has a series of mountains. There's never just one mountain. Um, the whole thing just feels like this eternal climb and it's never really and it's never really over but the biggest the the, the biggest um or the earliest mountain i suppose was the time theater in episode one it was such a huge to bring loki up to speed loki from 2012 loki loki who'd finished the first avengers film so full of anger and grievance and um so bristling with 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 rage and um self-denial and all these things and what the scene is doing is it's bringing that loki up to date so he knows as much as the audience do in this brilliantly crafted conversation with mobius which is like like being in psychoanalysis or being processed institutionally being confronted with his past, confronted with his mistakes, confronted with patterns of behavior and thinking, which are damaging to him um, and rendering his glorious purpose to be meaningless. And it was such a big swing and it was such a ambitious thing to do um, in terms of execution and, and in, in terms of performance. And when we'd finished that scene in the time theater and we, it, we I, it kind of, we knew that was over, I thought, okay, first lap, the end of the first lap, <laughs> I, you know, I've got some gas in the tank for, for some more running, but at least I've, you know, the first lap is, uh, has been run. Um, so that's probably, that's probably it. Episode one. Well, again, it's such a fantastic show. I want to thank you all so much for being here. I want to remind everyone at home that all the episodes are available now on Disney Plus, so you don't have to wait a very long week in between anymore. <laughs> thank you so, so much for being here. Thanks, Janelle, thank very much indeed. Cheers, thank you. Thank you. Thanks.